Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this webinar where we'll discuss the adoption of EARS notation to improve requirements engineering. Uh, my name is Marie, I will be the host. So today we have uh, Mav as a guest speaker, Alistair Mavin, uh, who is an independent requirement specialist based in the UK. He is known internationally for his requirements training, coaching and consulting. Uh, Mav is the lead author of Easy Approach to Requirement Syntax, EARS, and he has published many peer reviews papers on requirements, system engineering, and creativity. He is a member of the British Computer Society uh, of INCOSI, and he is a chartered engineer. So today, Mav is going to go um, to discuss today how to write better requirements with the EARS notation, the benefits that teams and individuals can uh, take out of it, and um, yeah, uncover also what is yet to know. Um, we also have, towards the end of the presentation, Joseph Pitarisi, who is Senior Product Manager at JAMA Software. Uh, Joseph uh, is managing and leading the JAMA Software Lab, and he will introduce a new tool, the JAMA Connect Requirement Advisor, uh, that is going to be released soon, and how this will facilitate embedding EARS notation in your requirements engineering work. So, Mav, um, I will hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, if you're going to have to listen to me for half an hour, you might want to know who I am. So, who is this Mav bloke? So, uh, to give you some context, uh, I was brought up on a farm. Why do I tell you that? Well, my father uh, was uh, a very practical maker, uh, as you might expect as a, as a farmer. He uh, he made uh, trailers to carry 20 tons of silage and corn and things like that. He built most of the farm buildings. He did fencing. Uh, he did lots and lots of practical things on the farm. Uh, somehow, amongst being a farmer and having four children, he had spare time to do hobbies. And he used to make uh, reproduction furniture that looked like antiques because he made it really well. Why do I mention all that? Well, one of his favorite expressions was if he was doing some work in the sheep shed, he would say, that's near enough for sheep work. So whilst he was capable of doing and, and often did make things that were uh, what you might say high integrity, like if he was making a trailer that had to carry a lot of weight, um, it would be very well engineered and researched and done really well. Uh, if he was doing something that was that didn't need to be done to, as it were, a high integrity or highly well finished, then he would do it well enough for that. And perhaps that's kind of guided uh, my journey through systems engineering, requirements engineering. Uh, many notations, many approaches, many people uh, tend to advocate very heavyweight methods that mandate lots and lots of work for everything. Uh, but a lot of that is often overhead that isn't necessary in many cases. So doing enough for the job in hand has perhaps guided my approach and probably including ears. So many years later, I went to City University in London to do a degree in business computing systems um, as a mature student. Uh, while I was there, one of the modules was on requirements engineering. And in contrast to almost all the other modules, it wasn't all the other modules were basically fairly deterministic and black and white, and there's one right way of doing things, or, or at least there's a, there's a correct answer, if you like. Um, whereas requirements engineering was much more informal in some ways. It was about a journey from the informal to the formal. It was about how you go from... Uh, thoughts in people's heads. People have some very w vague, uh, indistinct goals that might be quite ambiguous, or they might have an ill-founded problem, something they think maybe they should address, but it's not very clear. And it's the journey from that, it, which is kind of the genesis of any system, product, or, or service development, to a working system, which should be deterministic and precise, and you should know how it's going to behave. So the journey from the informal to the formal, or the vague to the deterministic, is kind of fascinating and difficult and interesting. Um, and it hooked me from then, basically. So having worked at City University as a researcher for a few years when I finished my degree, I then got a job with a company called Praxis Critical Systems, who are based in Bath, which is a, a lovely city in the southwest of England with uh, nice architecture. Uh, while I was working at uh, Praxis, uh, who are now part of Capgem, I, uh, I worked for clients including Rolls-Royce, Bombardier, BE Systems and so on, doing uh, requirements engineering in, in those high integrity safety systems. Uh, I then spent 14 years at Rolls-Royce. Um, uh, the departments I worked in in that time included uh, whole engine, uh, control systems, future programs, 
um, I did work corporately across the whole organization. Uh, and in my time there, I sort of accidentally created EARS. Um, I say that because uh, being practitioners, we just did some useful work uh, and then subsequently decided that maybe it might be useful to other people. Uh, and one of my, uh, what became my co-authors, one of the people who was working with me on the work that led to EARS, convinced me that we should write a paper about it, which effectively became EARS. So what is this requirements engineering thing all about anyway? Well, in theory, you could say that requirements engineering is quite easy. What is requirements engineering? Well, you ask people what they want, you write it down, you build it, and then you check that it does what they ask for. Like a lot of things, if you put it to a high level, it's perhaps quite simple. Um, but there's obviously a lot more to requirements than that, and they are in themselves quite slippery and difficult things. Um, but relevant to ears, I think, is the notion that asking people what they want and then writing them down, how you choose to write it down can guide what you ask them to tell you and can help them to tell you the useful things that you can then write down more effectively. So the inherent nature of ears, which I'll explain in a little more detail, um, helps a lot with elicitation because it identifies the things you need to know in order to write down a, a well-formed ears compliant requirement. There are certain things you need to know to be able to populate an ears requirement effectively. And that means you interrogate people, you ask people the right questions to be able to write a good question. So from very early in your requirement solicitation, you're you're seeking the right information to get clearer requirements. So Yogi Berra, you can probably tell by the by the picture, uh, was a baseball player, probably quite well known to those in North America, less so elsewhere in the world. Uh, Yogi Berra is a good one for for interesting quotes. There's hundreds of very funny Yogi Berra quotes. The one I'm I'm going to do today is he says, "In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is." I'll say that again. In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. So I've said that in theory, uh, requirements engineering is very easy. In practice, it's not so easy. So first of all, people don't necessarily know what they want. So if they don't know what they want, they can't tell you. Or maybe they do know what they want, but they don't know quite how to express it. Or if they're an expert in something, and after all, many requirements are elicited from subject matter experts in various fields, it's a well-known characteristic of experts that they don't actually consciously know some of what their knowledge is. It's so obvious to them and them and implicit, it's tacit, they actually would struggle to, to articulate it because it's so obvious to them they don't think of even mentioning it. That makes it quite a tricky discipline. Um, people want different things. So if you've got a whole load of stakeholders, they're going to want different things. They may be intention or in direct conflict. Who do you even ask anyway? Who are all the stakeholders? almost always more than you first realize. Some of those stakeholders may not be available. They may, you may literally not be able to get hold of them because they're too busy or uh, contractually or geographically or in time zones or for whatever reason, it might be hard to actually speak to those people. And of course, requirements also come from other places than people from documents and so on. One issue that is quite common is a problem in requirements in terms of eliciting and documenting requirements is when people confuse goals and requirements. What I call goals and what Encozy tends to call needs and other people call other things are high level aspirational things, people that things, things that people want. Uh, so my sort of joke that I use when I'm doing uh, requirements training is a goal is like the Spice Girls say, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. So goals are fundamentally aspirational. They're kind of often about emotions and how you want to feel, but they're not really about a system. Requirements are about the system that you're going to build, which will address the goals. So goal. So, but sometimes when you when you're seeking requirements, people give you goals. So you've got to be careful to to clarify the difference between goals and requirements. Obviously, there's many other ways that requirements is difficult than than what I've got here. But one of the many is that requirements are all projects are all different. Uh, projects are different in terms of how novel and risky the, the product or uh, service or system that you're building, how novel and risky that is and how new it is to you, how big the project team is, how experienced they are, how geographically dispersed they are, how well you know the suppliers and so on, if you're using some new tools or notation or whatever. All these things make each project different. So the, the, the notion that you can just reuse good practice or best practice is is optimistic at best. At the very least, you have to tailor things. 